Hi, I'm Femi O.K. Brazil, Indonesia and the Democratic Republic of Congo are some of the most critical rainforests in the whole world. So critical that they're often referred to as the lungs of the world. In November, the three countries signed an alliance which is to aim to safeguard the rainforests in Indonesia, Brazil and the Democratic Republic of Congo. So on this episode of the stream, we are asking if this triple alliance can really save our rainforests. Do you have an opinion? I know you have. Our comment section is right here on YouTube. Be part of today's discussion. Hello, Bart and Kiki and Layla. So good to have your expertise with us on today's discussion. Bart, please say hello to our audience around the world. Tell them who you are and what you do. Hello, good evening. Um, thanks for having me on the show. I'm uh, Bart Creset. I am a, a tropical ecologist and I uh, specialize in peat swamp forest in the central Congo basin and particularly in the Democratic Republic of Congo, um, where I've been working for a number of years. Okay. And I'm also an environmental journalist and as such uh, follow these, uh, these issues closely. Kiki, welcome to the stream. Please introduce yourself to our audience. Thank you. Hello. Uh, Hello. Good morning. I'm Kiki Taufik. I lead for Indonesia uh, forest campaign uh, globally for Greenpeace Southeast Asia Indonesia. I based in Jakarta at the moment. And Leila, welcome to the stream. Say hello to our audience, tell them who you are and what you do. Hello everyone, good morning, good afternoon, evening, wherever you are. Uh, my name is Leila Salazar Lopez. I am the executive director of Amazon Watch and we work to protect and defend the Amazon and our climate in solidarity with indigenous peoples. And I'm calling in from San Francisco, California. First reaction, guess, when you heard about the Triple Alliance between Indonesia, the DRC and Brazil, what did you think? Layla, thoughts in a sentence. Of course, um, at these global gatherings, there's lots of announcements and pledges and commitments made and we need a lot more commitments made for protecting our forests and our climate so yes of course welcome this announcement now it's about the implementation uh -huh. if this is really truly a reality later but do we really need more commitments how many commitments do we need because we get commitments but we don't get action and action that's delivered i remember being in glasgow during cop 26 and it was such an amazing cop for rainforests. It was right. the rainforest cop. And a lot of those promises have been walked back pretty quickly. Let me just bring in here, but, but uh, you, I know you know the DRC really well. The DRC was quite prominent in those promises made about the rainforest. And then a few months later, they were prospecting for fossil fuels in those same rainforests mm. they were going to protect. I am deeply cynical, but should I be? Well, um... I think that's partly right. Yeah, um, there, there's there's reason to be cynical about those pledges, especially if you look at um, what is happening in the in the Congo Basin, where the where the government is is uh, uh, facilitating oil exploration and gas exploration under the rainforest. Um, but then at the same time, this 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 alliance is is important and might really help to. Um, uh, to share lessons among these three different countries, right. lessons that have been learned in the past, that they can that they can can learn from each other, and 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 also, it might make it easier to to keep them accountable. Lele, go ahead. I know something on your mind. Go ahead. Me? Yeah, yeah. Art articulate your thought. I can see you thinking. <laughs> well, you know, going back to Glasgow. Um, there was over $1.7 billion pledged by governments, by private institutions, by foundations to elevate the importance and commit to protecting forests and indigenous peoples. Only 7% of that um, pledge has been actually allocated to indigenous peoples organizations, oh. according to the Ford Foundation. Yeah. Um, we just saw the fund at COP27 about loss and damage, um, which is, for me, that that is critical for many of us and who work with communities on the front lines who are facing the fires and the floods and the devastation by the climate crisis, we know that these funds are critical. Um, they are reparations for the people that have been mostly harmed, but they need to be 
they need to be implemented quickly. We don't have another 10 years. Kiki, I see you nodding. Go ahead. Join our conversation. Yeah, I think, I think the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, because the Global North role is uh, in the driving deforestation and because it is a uh, beneficiary of biodiversity and ecosystem uh, services our remaining forests provide. Wealthy countries uh, must provide financing for the protection and restoration of tropical forests. Uh, importantly, though, this uh, must be through credible funding mechanism that respected uh, human rights, are transparent, and do not drive uh, corruption. I think that's just the uh, uh, three pillars we need to make sure uh, for the uh, uh, financing uh, of the forest protection. But more, uh, we are welcome, the cooperation of this, because we are sharing a similar challenge of global agribusiness driving uh, deforestation in our three countries. What does that cooperation I, mean, Kiki? Kiki, what, what does that mean? Is it you're going to share scientists, you're going to share notes, um, you're going to pledge that you're not going to deforest any more of your tropical rainforest? What does that alliance actually mean? Okay. So the cooperation means that, uh, as uh, I think Bart already mentioned before, we can sharing the, uh, the expertise. We can sharing about the uh, our experience also. Uh, most of our, uh, most uh, most importantly, as I mentioned before, is uh, we need to put uh, 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 the indigenous people uh, yes. because indigenous people are critical to forest Kiki, protection. I'm so glad that you said countries. that. I'm so glad you said that. Uh, at the recent UN climate conference, known as COP27, which happened in Egypt. Indigenous voices rose up and said, you need to include us. When we're talking about the rainforest, you're talking about our house, our homes. We're important. Let me share with our audience some of those voices. Indigenous people has been always considered as incapable to manage the funding, while they have been capable to protect our climate, the environment. I think they are the best person to get did uh, this money. Anna, I hope they will manage it in a good way. On a day-to-day -day basis, it is the indigenous communities who experience the impact of climate change. In my case, it's very bad. It is not only a climate change, it is a change in structure which is affecting indigenous towns. In this case, we are talking about constant rain. Last year, during the pandemic, it flooded the Amazon basin. All the rivers in the Amazon basin overflowed. On the other hand, you have droughts. So these are things that we are experiencing every day. Well, are you seeing that this increased awareness of indigenous communities have a really good sense of what is best for their own land and what is best for their own communities? Is there that acceptance now? Is it beginning to change? Well, um, it's glad to see my, my colleague there, Nadino, from, from the Ecuadorian Amazon. Um, Indigenous peoples have been protecting uh, the forests, whether from the Amazon, the Congo, Indonesia. They are the best protectors of the forests, of the biodiversity. In fact, 80% of our planet's biodiversity are on Indigenous peoples' lands. And so that's why, whether you're at COP27 talking about, you know, protecting forests and Indigenous peoples being the guardians and the stewards of the forests, or you're at COP15 that's taking place now, which is the Biodiversity Convention, the, the critical, critical commitment that we need out of these global gatherings is not only the recognition um, of Indigenous peoples as uh, guardians, but as uh, protectors and defenders, and that are definitely capable, um, they've been doing it for thousands of years, definitely capable of protecting and managing um, their own forests and the resources to protect those forests. Mm -hmm. I am going to bring in. I think uh, uh, what, yes, what is ahead, really important is, is, um, is that the pledges that have been made by governments and by um, private companies as well, the, the, the billions and, and of money that, um, that have been pledged, that, that we find ways to make sure that the money actually reaches those communities on the ground. 
All right, Bart, so happening, Bart think... let, me, let me put this to you. This is Joe from a little bit earlier on. He, he joined our conversation from, he's the Rainforest Foundation UK. He, he challenged us to answer this question, Bart. You kind of bring it up quite nicely. So here's Joe, have a listen to Joe and then respond to him immediately. Containing half of the world's remaining tropical forests, it's unsurprising that the DRC, Brazil and Indonesia have come together in this kind of way. However, beyond the rhetoric, what are these countries actually doing to safeguard their forests, as well as the rights of tens of millions of indigenous peoples and other local communities that inhabit these areas? For example, in DRC, the government recently auctioned 30 oil and gas blocks covering millions of hectares and the Kuvit Central peatlands, the largest terrestrial carbon sink on Earth. It also recently signalled its intention to lift a 20-year ban on new logging concessions in the country. So when we talk about a new pact to protect forests, any funding needs to be attached to improve forest governance, rooting out corruption, and most importantly, channeling support to those on the front lines of tropical deforestation. Yeah. Well, it's, it's right what, what Joe is saying here. Um, the, the DRC government in particular is, is um, sending mixed signals to the international community. On the one hand, um, trying to show its commitment to, to forest uh, conservation through this alliance, for example. And then on the other hand, um, auctioning off oil blocks in the rainforest and in, in uh, uh, peatlands that are critical for the, for the, for the global climate. So, um, uh, it, it, yeah, the question is how serious are they about, about these commitments? Um, and um, I think there's, 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 that means also that there's a role to play for the international community to keep them accountable and to, to follow up on their support as well. But can, um, I, can I ask you, though, because I know you specialise sure. in the DRC, how serious would you say the DRC is, which is a, it's a country that you know very well, about protecting their tropical rainforests? Um, well... The DRC, like I said, the DRC government is giving off mixed signals. Yeah. So, so these these oil blocks that that are that are being auctioned off are really uh, just going to be destructive for for the rainforest and for the global climate as well. Sure. Um, this this rainforest is is taking up carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, um, and more than it's releasing at the moment, and thereby providing a a surface, so you will, to to all of us, to humanity. And and, uh, and and in fighting climate change, um, so when we lose that surface, um, uh, that will make it even harder for us to 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 um, attain the Paris okay. uh, Paris Agreement. Right. I've got some questions from that audience who are very pointed in what they would like to know, i.e., what kind of emergency are we in regarding our rainforest? So, on YouTube. Joe says that saving the rain rainforest sounds good, but how about saving its people, the children of the rainforest? Uh, Leila, thoughts yeah. very briefly yeah. on this. Uh, I mean, I literally was thinking we got to back up here and talk about what the state of, of the Amazon and the state of the forests yeah. um, are. And um, the Amazon rainforest, which is what I focus on and what our organization focuses on, the Amazon is in a state of emergency. The Amazon is at a tipping point. And why? It's going back to what, what Bart was talking about. It's about the deforestation. It's about the de degradation. It's about the lawlessness, the illegal activity, the illegal logging, the illegal mining, and also the legal, the permissions incentivized by the government in Brazil in particular, incentivizing um, uh, uh, land grabbing, incentivizing agribusiness expansion, fossil fuel extraction, mineral extraction, whether it be legal or illegal. All of this has led to the Amazon rainforest being at a tipping point. Mm. And so it's at a tipping point and um, indigenous peoples who are on the front lines um, are under attack because they're defending their rainforest, they're defending their lands, they're defending their ancestral ter territories. So what they are calling on all of us, they are joining together indigenous peoples, scientists, activists, academics, NGO allies, we're all coming together to say, 
For the Amazon, we must protect permanently 80% of the Amazon by 2025, not 2030, not 2040 or 50. We need urgent commitments now. And that means we need Lula, who is a newly elected president of Brazil, mm -hmm. um, to do what he, he said in his campaign promises. All right, Leila, let's, let, let, let's, yeah, let's, well. let's remind our audience what he said, what he promised. Um, so this is the uh, president-elect for Brazil. Yes. Let's have a listen. Mm -hmm. Dear companions, there's no climate security for the world without a protected Amazon. We will spare no efforts to have zero deforestation and the degradation of our biomes by 2030. We are going to rigorously punish those responsible for any illegal activity, whether mining, gold digging, wood extraction or agricultural occupation. These crimes affect mostly indigenous people. This is why we will create the Ministry of Indigenous People, so that they can present to the government policies that guarantee them their survival, security, peace and sustainability. To our viewers watching via YouTube, uh, mixing politics and conservation, they do go hand in hand. Um, uh, Laura mentions that Bolsonaro, the outgoing president of Brazil, has consistently had no concern for the rainforest. So now what? So you heard the sound now what coming from the president-elect. Again on YouTube, and I'm going to ask you, Kiki, to do this very briefly so that we can get in many, many thoughts from our audience who are watching. What are the main challenges when we're looking at safeguarding our tropical rainforest? For you, what is the number one challenge? Okay, so number one challenge, of course, uh, are related with the uh, uh, transparency and then uh, a credible uh, mechanism. I think. I think main challenge is uh, in in here is a lot of uh, a deal uh, before it's not really uh, transparent, and then also it's go to the uh, fake solution, because uh, if we're talking about this uh, uh, the, the 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 emission for example, there is a a, a carbon market uh, a solution coming from the uh, the. Uh, the global, uh, especially global north, which is uh, for 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 our for our view that this uh, uh, this is part of the uh, fast solution. So we need to make sure that no fast solution, any deal based on carbon market to low polluting countries to use the rainforest of this region to offset their emission, mm -hmm. will undermine the only real solu uh, solution, reducing gas uh, house gas emission. So there must be no deal that allow polluting countries to keep breaking havoc in uh, on the planet. Kiki, the moment and we need to merge exactly. That. Sure, Kiki, the moment you said fake solution, both Bart and and uh, Leila started nodding their head very, very emphatically. Um, what uh, have you seen, uh, Bart? That is definitely a fake solution to preserving our tropical rainforests. Well. Uh, f financing for, for, for conservation is really needed, but mm. um, carbon markets are really problematic because s s s um, very often what you see is that, that claims are being made of, of amounts of carbon being avoided, uh, uh, carbon yeah. emissions being avoided, that, that haven't been backed up by reality. Um, so uh, the transparency of how, how those markets are being managed and how those those quantities are, are calculated is really important. And um, uh, so if there is going to be any alliance between these three countries, and especially yeah. in terms of uh, a common carbon market for, for rainforest uh, uh, pr protection, then, then how, how that is being managed needs to be very transparent indeed. Leila? Exactly. And we can't... You know, coming out of COP27, I think a lot of us were happy about the loss and damage fund. Um, it is reparations for those most affected. And yet, you know, there's, you know, the fossil fuel industry continues to dominate um, the, um, the climate and the biodiversity discussions. And what, you know, and, and um, what this means is that we're, we're coming up with Band-Aid solutions for what we really need to do. Instead of saying we need to decarbonize and really um, commit to reducing um, our 
our use of fossil fuels and um, shifting from extraction um, to a just transition, we're still allowing the fossil fuel industries to do business as usual and allow them to continue to pollute and say they're protecting forests, they're investing in protecting forests when they're not. Um, and they're just talking oh. about offsetting solutions, which are, are, are not true solutions to protecting our yeah. forests. I'm just looking here at my laptop at um, some of the thoughts and ideas that came out of COP27. Have a look here on my laptop. Colombia will propose creating an Amazon block against deforestation. And then earlier we spoke to Leila Yassin, who was also talking about a bigger alliance, not just Indonesia, Brazil and the Democratic Republic of Congo, but many more countries. This is what she told us. Mm -hmm. So despite the fact that the global rate of forest destruction has slowed down in 2021 and 2022, it is still not enough to meet the 2030 commitments made last year by 140 countries. And because forests are so vital to combat climate change and stabilize it at 1.5 degrees, we've seen again this year during COP27 the launch of several international initiatives to keep last year's momentum alive by accelerating the implementation of actions to both hold deforestation and forest degradation by 2030 with a special focus on sustainable forest management and the role of indigenous peoples and the local communities in preserving these ecosystem. So yes, it is alive and now we need to implement. Kiki, what do you think needs to happen for everybody to act with the sense of urgency with which you've been talking to us here on the stream? Like, we have to act now. 2025 is, is like tomorrow, basically. There's no time at all. What do we need to act that quickly? Yeah, so <clears throat> I think I think as uh, everybody also uh, mentioned that uh, we need to act now for... Uh, a more more clear uh, action and then also we need to more uh, uh, more than the recognition of uh, where we need to be what's like the catalyst the kiki kiki what would you say what's the catalyst because i hear leila saying 2025 i do not think it's going to happen because we don't act fast enough kiki what's the catalyst going to be uh, uh you can be honest you can say we're not going to make it <laughs> Right, you can be honest, but yeah, it's yeah, going to be a very depressing um, end of the show. Yeah, I think I think oh. I think you're right. I mean, that's we are we are also uh, in between uh, optimistic and also pessimistic with this <laughs> current situation. I, lo I like that. Especially I'm not sure what that means. Especially in Indonesia, is. for example. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for example, in Indonesia, that's uh, uh, we. We have uh, uh, the government said that they are already protecting more than. 50% of the protect area. Yeah. However, in the same time, also government Indonesia trying to still opening the uh, the investment to uh, uh, to opening the project national project strategy like sure. like food estate, for example. When we facing with the uh, pandemic situation, WHO mentioning that every country not, need to be uh, right. uh, prepared for okay. food security. And government Indonesia coming with the solution for uh, food estate, which is sure. opening another forest. Which is this is also a fake solution. All right. So, okay, uh, I have I think... fifty seconds, Leila. That is half a sentence. I am. <laughs> Kiki's left us between optimistic and pessimistic. What is one sentence to close our show with? One sentence, Leila. We need to keep forests standing and we need a moratorium on the further destruction with it, whether it be fossil fuels, logging, mineral extraction. We need a moratorium on the destruction and we need to keep the forest standing. Mm -hmm. And we need investments in the protection, not in the destruction of the rainforests. Thank you, Leila and Kiki and Bart and for viewers for your conversation on YouTube. Our question was, can a new triple alliance save rainforests from ruin? And the question it, and the answer to that is, we are not sure. We are halfway between optimistic and pessimistic, but we need to act. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time. Take care, everybody.